Did you know that 73% of prospective employees won't apply or accept a position at a company that doesn't offer modern work experiences? If you want to learn more, visit vmware.com forward slash employee dash experience. But I'm going to give you another reason to visit that page, and I have to confess that this is one of the coolest podcast sponsorships I've done with my friends at VMware because they are actually giving away copies of my upcoming book, The Future Leader. And this is where I interviewed over 140 CEOs around the world to figure out what it will take to be a leader in the next decade and beyond. They're giving away a limited number of copies. So if you want one for free, then again, make sure to check out vmware.com forward slash employee dash experience to claim yours. We're all curators designing experiences for other people. And so the way to be a good experience designer is to really know who you are designing an experience for and what that individual wants. And it requires extra effort. And all of us are in relationships in our own lives. We know what it means to give and nurture a relationship or when we're being sloppy. And if we want to attract people to us, whether they are employees or customers, Today requires being extremely thoughtful, not leaving it up to chance. And we have all of these amazing tools that help us in that pursuit of of designing delicious experiences for other people that they actually want and that make them want to be around us. And so it's really this theme of earning your keep every single day, not taking it for granted. And that's really how as an employer or as a business trying to make money, You're not ever going to make money or attract really smart employees by accident. That's Blake Morgan, best-selling author, speaker, and futurist. Her brand new book just came out and it's called The Customer of the Future, 10 Guiding Principles for Winning Tomorrow's Business. Oh, and by the way, she's also my wife. There is a lot of overlap and connection between the employee experience and the customer experience. So I wanted to bring in one of the world's leading experts to talk about just that. In this episode, you will learn what it takes to create a truly human organization, how customer and employee experience connect and impact each other, what your company can do to become more customer experience focused, and a whole lot more. Blake also shares a few candid and personal employee and customer experience stories from her life and her career. I think the problem is that the fear-based culture, like it can, it works. Like people will do anything when they're afraid, but what are you missing out on? What could be if you didn't lead with fear, if you didn't lead in a punishment-based organization, but more about inspiration. Here's what is possible. Here's the vision. Here's your role in the vision. And I'm sure you can speak because you did all those interviews, but to me, it's, it's actually more powerful to be positive, but it's harder because I think it's easy as a human being to succumb to negativity. I think most of us are wired for negativity. It's easier to be negative. It's much easier. This is Jacob Morgan, best-selling author, speaker, and futurist. Welcome to the Future of Work podcast, where every week I speak with C-level executives, business leaders, and authors to explore how the workplace is changing and what the future of work is going to look like. The goal of this show is to give you the insights, the ideas, and the inspiration to help future-proof your career and your organization. If you want to get access to more content, such as podcast transcriptions and information on working with me or having me keynote your next event, you can visit my website at thefutureorganization.com. If you want to take your education even further by getting access to courses that explore these themes in more depth, then check out futureofworkuniversity.com. Also, if you get a few seconds, please rate and review the podcast on iTunes or whatever your preferred channel is. It really helps the show, and I personally appreciate it, since the podcast does take quite a bit of effort to produce. In case you're interested in sponsoring the podcast or working with me, my email is jacob at thefutureorganization.com. 
Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Future of Work podcast. I have a very special guest today. She is a best selling author, speaker, futurist. Her brand new book is called The Customer of the Future 10 Guiding Principles for Winning Tomorrow's Business. And by the way, she's also my wife. And I know on this show, even though I talk a lot about the future of work, employee experience, and leadership, a lot of the listeners are also very interested in the customer experience side of things because there's a lot of uh, connection and overlap between what happens inside of companies and what happens outside of cu- uh, outside of companies with our customers. And so I figured, why not interview one of the world's leading experts on this topic? And she has a brand new book that just came out. So Blake, welcome to the show. Hi, Jacob. Thank you for having me. Of course. And we're sitting here... Uh, at home on our comfy couch with our two dogs next to us. So if you hear any dogs growling in the background, I apologize in advance. So obviously, I know you very well, but a lot of people listening to the podcast might not know your your story. So why don't you let listeners know, how'd you get involved with this stuff? What's your your background, your story? Like most good things in life, I completely fell into the topic of customer experience by accident. I had moved to New York City because I felt that the world had good things in store for me other than living near my parents. And I moved there with big dreams of being a glamorous magazine editor. And soon I saw the print industry uh, put the last nail in the coffin. And I realized the jobs in that industry really were drying up. And so I got recruited randomly for my journalism skills by a conference company. And I spent five years there. I spent a few years producing events, which it was funny because you'd give all this responsibility to like a 21 year old. So you'd go out and you'd run an entire event by yourself at 21. So it was pretty shocking in a good way, though. I started networking and doing uh, influencer and social media engagement, even though I, nobody called it that because it was 2006. And a couple years into that stint at the conference company, the chairman and I would were kind of friendly. And he was kind of the silent partner. And he wanted to turn a conference company into a, a media company. He saw what was happening with digital content. And so I had this great chance to be a brand, which no one talked about at the time, but I was the online persona before that was really something that companies did. And I had a podcast in 2009 called Customer Creation with Blake Landau. Which before. people can still... I think it's you, still online. If you, if you want to hear Blake's podcast from over a decade ago, you can still Google that and find some funny things on there. Yeah. And uh, I, I have a lot of interviews still up online. And... I met Jacob a few years later after I had been focusing on customer experience. And this was back when really this wasn't a hot topic. CRM was an exciting topic for maybe like 10 people who were interested in it, in it plus Zappos, of course, the shoe company, the shoe e-commerce website. And I had all of this online content already And I moved to San Francisco to be with Jacob and I took a bunch of terrible jobs and really couldn't find my footing for a few years until I became a a customer service executive for a Fortune 100 software company for two years. Then I realized I hated working in the corporate world and I wanted to just continue all the thought leadership I had been doing on the side full time focusing on my customer experience column on Forbes, my new podcast show, and really doing what Jacob did, which was focusing on being a speaker and a thought leader full time. That was really my dream because I love content. I love the being part of the conversation. I love selling and curating information products. That's what I do. And now it's been about 12 years. And I really feel like this topic is so important. And I've enjoyed creating this new category of customer experience and helping bring my message of customer centricity to people all over the world to help them understand that, hey, if you treat people well, if you make people's lives easier and better, they will always come back. And really, the point is always about nurturing relationships and 
earning a place in someone's life by being helpful to them. That's really the, the premise of everything that I do. And even in my new book, The Customer of the Future. Very cool. And then what is it about customer experience that attracted you to, to this space? I think I've always been kind of a sensitive young lady caring about how caring about emotions, caring about relationships and and so that really transfers over nicely to the area of customer experience because it's all about how you make people feel and what experience you're building for them. I think being a sensitive person that I have like antenna, I have like freakish antenna radar on my head invisible and Jacob can attest to this that I'm really intuitive I can often pick up on things in the room that other people won't see um, and it comes from being introverted I was a complete bookworm my whole childhood and watched a lot of documentaries like I'm just interested in being a a listener and a watcher of the world you won't find me being like the loudest person at the party i'll be someone in the corner watching or having a conversation with one or two people and that's my personality and i think it's transferred over nicely to studying human behavior um, and helping educate others on these like nuances of building relationships and um, making people feel feel good and being thoughtful and that's really the word of everything i do I always believe that companies would benefit from hiring more thoughtful leaders because today we're competing on thoughtfulness. We're competing on the knowledge of how we can make our customers' lives easier and better. Even with employee experience, we're competing on thoughtfulness. Well, what are the experiences that employees who work here want to have? And how can we be a competitive um, and attractive company to these these employees by being extremely considerate of what the modern employee wants. I know that one of the things that you always talk about is uh, the difference between customer experience and customer service. And those are very popular terms that are thrown around a lot, oftentimes inter intermingled, interchanged with one another. So what is the difference between customer experience and customer service? So when I started in this industry, and I really started focusing on it like five, six years ago, I was really frustrated because I found that so many customer service technology companies, they really wanted to own the topic of customer experience. So they would use it interchangeably with the phrase customer service, customer experience and customer service as if they were the same thing. And that really made no sense to me because I felt, well, Service is what happens when a product breaks, but experience, now that can be shaped by your engineers of the product, who you hire, so much more than what happens after that product leaves a factory and lands into the hand of the customer. And so in my first book, I tried to set the record straight on, hey, customer experience shaped by a lot more than simply your contact center. So, hey, customer service industry people, stop using these phrases interchangeably. You're damaging this new and exciting category of experience, which involves many other groups. Often, actually, marketing owns this category. And, and that was really my goal, was to set the record straight on these two phrases and how different they actually were. When you look at the, I don't want to say the history of customer experience, but it's clearly becoming a very big topic now. Are there any particular trends that are really forcing organizations to spend more time looking at customer experience now? I would say the biggest trend is the whale of Amazon is that comp forever now companies are changed because customers have experiences with Amazon, with Spotify, music listening, with Apple products, with Netflix, and you get these deliciously personalized, easy, seamless, zero friction customer experiences. And then you look at some of the most hated industries out there like insurance, cable, telecom. These organizations are just so slow. They're moving at a glacial pace to keep up with these trends. And and that's really, I mean, Amazon has changed the game for everybody. But I think it was... It, Amazon, it, it was inevitable that one company would figure out all of these things because we, ha we all have all of the same technology, but not all of us are so obsessed with the experience as Jeff Bezos is at his company. 
You actually have a, a pretty interesting story in your book about Jeff that, that shows just how obsessed he is with customer experience. Can you share that story? Because it's one of the one of my favorite ones, at least. Yeah, so Jacob and I had the chance to go up to Amazon last fall, and we really wanted to see the magic behind this company. Like, what is their secret sauce? So we had this chance to peek behind the curtain. And what we found really shocked us, or at least shocked me. And what I discovered when I went to Amazon, I didn't discover magic bunnies being pulled out of hats, uh, much to my disappointment. The most customer-centric company in the world, Amazon, clearly had really hardworking, humble people who were singularly focused on customer experience. And it was everywhere. It was in the language you'd see in the in the bathrooms, on the walls, in the shipping department, the head of HR, contact center agent, no matter who you talk to, everybody was drinking the Kool-Aid of customer experience. And that mindset piece is so rare. It doesn't, it rarely exists. And after a disappointing day of not seeing any magic, we I went to dinner with Jacob, actually, and a friend of Jacob's, who he's known for long, way longer than me. And that that is an employee at Amazon. And he told us this story of Jeff Bezos and a meeting Jeff was running around the holidays. And Jeff had 30 executives in the room, and he really wanted to get a, a pulse on what was happening with customer service because... Everybody listening on this podcast knows that during the holidays, call volume can go up in the contact center. You've got longer lines. You've got more transactions. And so Jeff had this meeting with 30 executives, and one of the executives was the head of customer service, and we'll call him John. And Jeff asked John, he said, hey, John, can you let me know how long does it take for a customer to reach an agent in the call center? And John had that look on his face, like when your boss asks you for something and you really don't know the answer, but you can't say no. So John says to Jeff, well, I think it's under a minute. Jeff looks at him, says, really? Okay, great. Let's see. Jeff takes out his phone, dials 1-800 Amazon customer service, puts it on speaker and sits it down on the table. And 30 executives sit around a room and they wait. One minute passes by. Nobody picks up. They wait. Two minutes pass by. Nobody picks up. They wait. Now, after three minutes, the head of service, John, is looking clearly uncomfortable. His face at this point has turned a dark shade of beet red, and he's sweating. Everyone in the room is looking pretty uncomfortable as well. And Jeff is looking visibly angry. Four and a half minutes pass by before someone picks up the phone and says, hello, this is Amazon customer service. How may I help you? Jeff hangs up the phone. Not long after this meeting, the head of service resigns. So my question is, in what world does the most recognizable CEO in the world literally the richest man in the world, care that much about something most CEOs would rather not care about, which is call center hold time. And that's what makes Amazon so special. It's that mindset. It's the thing that the CEO wakes up in the morning, he jumps out of bed, excited to serve somebody. And every other employee is aligned with that mindset. And it's this free, invisible thing This is the secret sauce that companies do not have. How does the employee experience fit in with the customer experience? And, you know, we we share a home office. We sit side by side. My most recent book's on employee experience. You have two books on customer experience. So we've talked about this quite a bit. And I know a lot of the listeners are very interested in how these two connect. So where is the connection point between what happens inside the company versus how those people treat customers. Everyone listening to this podcast, including you, Jacob, have been served by someone who clearly doesn't want to be there. Oh, yes. Like an employee who just almost seems depressed and you just feel sorry for them. You're like, gosh, what is going on? This job must really stink. And so clearly we've all been served by people who are not happy in their jobs. I don't think people are that different. What they want in their jobs, and you can speak to this as well, Jacob, is they want to feel safe at work. 
They want to feel comfortable. They want to have some agency over what they do. They want to be treated like an adult. They want to be compensated fairly. And when you don't do these things, when you miss the boat on employee experience and you forget that how you make your employees feel has an absolute impact on your customer's experience of your brand, you are missing the first piece in a customer experience strategy. And, you know, Jacob, I often share his research in my keynotes about culture, technology, and physical space, and the research he did that correlated employee experience with profits. And I just feel like there's so much common sense missing in the business world. It's like, it's like free money. It's like if you just have common sense and you are smart and you make long-term investments and you treat your people well and you're a human being with a soul and your company has a culture that has a soul, absolutely you will, you will be more profitable. And I'd love to talk to your audience about the Workday story maybe you've heard. Yeah, yeah. That was actually a really cool story. I like that one. So I, I like to tell this story. Um, I met an executive actually at a dinner thrown by my husband. Thanks, Jacob. And he, wor- <laughs> he is an HR executive at Workday. And he told me the story of a salesperson who worked at the software company. And this guy could not sell that darn software. ERP systems are notoriously difficult to sell. They're replaced only every 10 years. And this guy could not sell this product to save his life. And his day went from bad to worse because he found out that his daughter was suffering from dwarfism, which if any of you have kids, when your kid is sick, you know there's nothing more upsetting. And to make it worse, the insurance offered by the company wasn't going to cover any of the medical attention that she needed to become a normal, healthy toddler. So before quitting, because he can't sell the software and the insurance policy isn't good, he goes to HR, he sheepishly walks over and he says, hey guys, can I have an exception on this insurance policy? It would really mean a lot to me. To his surprise, they grant it. He gets the insurance coverage for his daughter, This guy, this sales guy, is so grateful that he has a complete turnaround. He starts selling everything. He becomes the highest grossing salesperson at the company, bringing in million dollar deals. And the company, with his help, becomes a billion dollar software company that we know it is today. But what I love about this story is that the head of HR didn't even remember approving this policy change for this young man because it was just so normal to be a human being and do the right thing for the human beings that work for you. And I think most companies, they're, they've they become so procedure obsessed, so operations obsessed, so money obsessed that they completely miss the human element. They treat their employees like robots, which is ironic because we're all afraid of being replaced by robots. Well, most companies already treat their employees like robots and their employees treat customers like robots. So if you listening to this are just the person that is not a robot, that has good values, that has integrity, your company has integrity, has a good culture, does the right thing when you can, you will, you are the company of the future. The book is called The Customer of the Future. The company of the future has a soul and has the culture to reflect that soul. And one of the reasons I like that story is because in a lot of organizations, if an employee doesn't meet their numbers, usually the first thing that happens is a manager goes over to them and they, you know, they have that that talk with them, the performance talk of like, hey, you're not meeting your numbers. You should meet them the next quarter. I've had that talk. Yeah. And and it's very much like get the numbers up or you're not going to be here very long. But it sounds like in this story, it wasn't just about that. It was more about, hey, what, what's going on, right? It's understanding what's going on in the person's personal life that maybe is impacting their ability to sell. And most companies never make that connection. They just see that if you're in sales, you're not closing your deals, but they don't ask why. Like, is there something going on at home? Is there some yeah, sort they of don't tra- care. Yeah, they don't care. They don't want to know. Are you dealing with a tragedy? Are you going through a divorce? Do you have a sick kid? Are you, you know, do you not have what you need to do your job? Yeah, do you exactly. not have training or onboarding? Exactly. They just purely look at the you didn't meet the numbers and your <laughs> your basic the whole talk is like meet the numbers next quarter or else. But don't you think like I could imagine what the Fortune 100 company I worked at? I could imagine my managers 
who one, I just didn't like at all. And I felt like he was kind of a robot. He had no EQ. He was a robot. I remember those. <laughs> I remember right, some of the stories. Sh- don't I expose won't say me. Anything. I won't say anything. Um, but I, I could imagine him saying, well, I'm held to these standards. If I don't perform, then I'll get fired. So why should I treat you any differently? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's the mentality that a lot of organizations have. And it's, uh, I guess to your earlier point, it does start at the top. Mm-hmm. If you as a senior leader treat your employees like that, those employees will then treat their employees like that. And actually for my new book uh, that's coming out in January, one of the interesting things of research that I found is that when you have toxic leaders, it sort of spreads like a virus. Mm -hmm. So a toxic leader um, creates that toxic culture. But the flip side of that is also true, is that when you have a good leader, that also spreads like a virus, a good virus. So it really does start with the leaders inside your company and the mentality and approach that they have. And if they're purely just focused on numbers and profits, then that's what everybody else is going to be focusing on to the detriment of creating that kind of a, a human company. I think the problem is that the fear-based culture, like it can, it works. Like people will do anything when they're afraid, but what, what are you missing out on? What could be if you didn't lead with fear, if you didn't lead in a punishment-based organization, but more about inspiration. Here's what is possible. Here's the vision. Here's your role in the vision. And I'm sure you can speak because you did all those interviews, but to me, it's, it's actually more powerful to be positive, but it's harder because I think it's easy as a human being to succumb to negativity. I think most of us are wired for negativity. It's easier to be negative. I agree. It's much easier. It's much harder to be a leader. But what I tell my audiences today in my in my speech for my book is that today we're living in a really complicated times. And I write about this in my book. And employees are going through complicated times and we've seen these different cultural waves and movements and the Me Too. And I mean, it's really changed uh, people's experience at work. And I think that today's environment, um, economic, environmental, political requires transformational leadership. And you're not going to get that by chance. We've got to spend more time hiring and developing really strong leaders with the values and the integrity that are aligned with the company, not just leave it up to chance. Yeah, need to have more purpose in, in how these things are done. And one of the other interesting things, and, and I talk about this as well when I look at employee experience, are these uh, this concept of moments that matter and understanding the important moments in the lives of your employees. And I was hoping you could share your story because what, so I think there are two specific moments that everybody can relate to. So first is your first day on the job. That's a very impactful moment that matters for for everybody. Another one might be when you have your first child, when you get married, when you get your first promotion. But in your case, you had a pretty impactful employee experience on your last day at (laughs) at your previous company, which, and I actually couldn't believe that story when you told me. Um, So can you share that story too? Because I think people will get a kick out of that. I'll never forget it. I had spent two years at this company Jacob's heard me talk about this a million times. When I was hired, I love my boss. She was like a mama bear. She took care of us. It was like a very typical male dominated software company that was started in the 60s, like very old culture. Some people might be able to figure out who the company is now. Software company. We can just go on my LinkedIn. Eventually (laughs) I might get sued, but I'm willing to take that chance. I don't Um, think that'll happen. Anyway, and I just adored this boss. Like I really felt... I mean, she was quirky, but I just felt like she really cared about me. I remember one day I was so stressed out because I was new and it's just my personality to try really hard. And she's like, Blake, can you, you need to breathe. Like you're not breathing. <laughs> I mean, that's not something a boss would normally say to their employee. They just ignore them like, wow, Barbara's weird. Um, but anyway, but unfortunately, after a while, she was demoted and they had this younger dude to replace her and take over the customer service team and we were literally i remember when it happened we were so we were getting on a flight to prague i was uh, yeah because she let me do a a speech about my work yeah with you we we were literally getting on a flight to prague we were both speaking at a conference there and we literally we just walked onto the plane and we were about to find our seats you were carrying our suitcases and all of a sudden blake gets this phone call and i remember you started crying like right after you found out 
Yeah, because I knew what was going to happen. Yeah. I already knew. Like I told you guys, I'm very intuitive. I saw it all happening before my eyes. And it did happen. You know, I wasn't a popular person there. I worked remotely. I was like a social media influencer. So, of course, everyone probably just thought I was full of myself and just into self-promotion. And I remember I would look on LinkedIn and like the general manager of the company was constantly looking at my LinkedIn profile, which is not that's not a great tool. If you're already paranoid, like don't don't use that tool. <laughs> but I remember he was constantly looking at my LinkedIn presence. And I'm like, why is this guy like doing this? But I think they had a plan like at big companies. They always go through this um, very carefully orchestrated long process to get you out. Like first they have to warn you and then you get like maybe a second warn. It's like, a, but it's all carefully orchestrated. Like if they want you out, you're out, but they'll, in order to not get sued, they'll go through like a three month process. But yeah, yeah so um, he eventually, I got, was, I was laid off and there well, were a so lot the of story layoffs. was, yeah, when we were on the flight, you found out that you're, the manager that you loved was being replaced by somebody who I guess had a reputation of not being that kind of warm human leader. Well, I had already worked with him. He was an employee on the team. And oh, so he, you already knew that's how he was. I already knew him and I knew I knew it wasn't gonna be good. So, and I knew it was already, and it was odd for me to be on the team. I was an oddball, as I said. I didn't have the, the technical training. Um, I was a social media influencer who talked about being customer centric, but I think I might've been a bad hire for this particular group because they weren't even ready for me. I was a change agent and they didn't want change. Long, but long story short, she was demoted. Well, and I also find, so before you move on, is that at the same company on that same team, there was one person that a lot of people loved and another person that a lot of people wanted to stay away from. And they both got to that position. They both got promoted by somebody. So I always find that to be really, really interesting. Well, you know, I think pe some people did like him. Like his, the people he already worked with and he protected and he had their backs. Like and it was a lot of guys, to be honest. Like they were, I think they were <laughs> excited because this person they were already had, they were simpatico with, he was getting promoted, which meant they would do well. I mean, it was complete. It yeah. wasn't about innovation. I mean, this is the, this is the problem with these big old companies. Like it's not about innovation. It's about survival. Yep. It's about hierarchy. Anyway, long story short, let's fast forward to the day of my exit interview. I go to Silicon Valley to turn in my laptop. My boss can't be there to say goodbye to me, of course. And this he, was the new boss, the guy. Yeah, he couldn't be there. He lived out of state and he had a man, another manager do the exit interview, you know, where you sign the paperwork, you hand over your badge and your laptop. She was literally running a, a meeting consecutively during this um, exit interview. So she would literally, she literally didn't talk to me or look me in the eye, just had me sign some things as she like led a team meeting on her laptop in the lobby of this corporation. And it was just the most inhuman, disgusting. Like, she didn't you ask wanna, you anything. She didn't. No. Like you just want to take a shower after you're like, ugh. it was so um, dehumanizing. And, you know, it's just, I just can't believe that people treat other people like this. And I did write about this experience in my book, although everybody's anonymous. Um, but it's just, it's really a shame to see it to see these companies go through this because I don't believe they're going to ever achieve the innovate, the innovation they once had. And this is why, because this kind of nonsense happens every single day inside these big companies. Today's leading companies understand the importance of enhancing the employee experience to maintain your competitive advantage and to achieve business goals. Retaining top talent is absolutely paramount to your success. That's why, and something that I've said many times over the years, is why IT and HR have to partner together to create great experiences for their workers. And if you are ready to separate from the pack, you can start with a report from VMware. And to get access to that report, you can visit vmware.com forward slash employee dash experience. And by the way, on that URL, you can also sign up to get a copy of my upcoming book, The Future Leader, where I interviewed over 140 CEOs around the world to figure out what it's gonna take to be a leader in the next decade and beyond. So if you wanna get access to that report and to get a free copy of my upcoming book, again, the URL is vmware.com 
forward slash employee dash experience. And now back to the show. Yeah. And I mean, even if, uh, I mean, if your last day or the way that they um, laid you off would have been a good experience, maybe you would have even considered going back in the, in the future. If it would have been, you know, if they treated you well, they treated you with respect, they said, we're sorry it didn't work out. Maybe there are future opportunities. This wasn't just the right hire. I mean, if they were human about it, who knows what, uh, what would have turned out. And I think it's true for a lot of employees when they quit or they get fired. Um, and I hear plenty of stories, especially here in the Bay Area at companies like Cisco or LinkedIn, where employees leave to go work somewhere else. And then after they work for another company, they realize how good they had it at the previous company. And they actually want to go back because that's how well they were treated, even mm -hmm. on their last day. But yeah. it sounds like in a lot of companies, once they know you're out the door, it's sort of like, you're dead to me. You're, uh, <laughs> yeah. you're just get out. And you know, my Don't first, come back. my first job was at a company that had a notoriously terrible culture, but I always landed with good bosses and they protected me. I mean, it wasn't, I wouldn't say it was the best culture, but I was so happy there. I really thrived. And it was because like, I remember my first boss, um, I mean, our daughter has the same name as her. <laughs> it's sort of coincidence. Um, but she, you know, you, you'll never forget your first job, your first boss. I remember we would, we went to San Diego to run some events and like, I mean, she really made me feel like an adult and she was a bit of a friend and a mentor. She was someone who was so much more mature for her age and so confident. I didn't have any confidence. I didn't know what I was doing, but I survived. I even thrived there. Now they tell stories about me to the new employees. They say- Sing songs about you. You're, you're the legend. You're don't like make a fun of me. This is, <laughs> I'm proud of this. They say, this is what you can become because it's a very difficult job. I wouldn't say it's, it's easy. It's a lot of- mundane work and um and it's difficult but they say like this is what you can become you you're can the become alumni. you're the success story yeah and it's not it wasn't a great culture it was because of my bosses and i think the manager that's really where the culture sits often is with that manager in the yeah. middle of the company and part of it is also acknowledging that even if your employees are young that I mean, a lot of younger employees are becoming leaders and managers and companies. She was super young and yeah. she managed older people. A lot of people in their early mid twenties are becoming leaders inside of organizations. And what I found out from my upcoming book is that the average age for somebody to get into a leadership program is guess how old? To get into a leadership program? Yeah. Like what's the average age for people to start a leadership training or development program? My God, maybe 40. Yeah. Mid forties. So you can imagine you are yeah. you are a leader in your maybe mid 20s and you literally go for 15 maybe 20 years before you even get taught how to lead properly before you get into any of these types of programs which is completely mind-boggling. That's I think, probably why the cultures are so bad yeah, too. Yeah, that's why the cultures are so bad. And so I think that's a great lesson that if you have leaders out there I mean, start these programs young. And you can tell as a customer. You can tell when you walk into an organization and they treat you well. Like my favorite example is a hospital because you're very vulnerable. And so things soak into your, like emotionally, you soak everything up. Like I remember we had our first daughter and I was very, very nervous the day you took me to deliver. You were nervous. Anything I felt. I didn't care about what was going <laughs> on with you. I was barely, I was just scared. And I just remember this nurse and she was so warm, so professional. I'm going to take care of you. Like this is someone who liked her job, felt pride in her work. We ran into her months later after I had my daughter. I, and I remember. Just, took a picture with her and gave her the biggest hug. Like, Jacob, you talk about these moments that matter. Like, why is it that we leave the training up to chance? It's ridiculous. If we would just invest in training, uh, customers would come back, tell their friends. In fact, that delivery story, I know you love when I talk about all oh, this it's gross my stuff. Favorite, my favorite topic. But, you know, it was kind of a disaster. Like, if you ask any woman, like, how was your labor and delivery? Like, no one's ever going to say to you, like, it was pretty easy, actually. It's maybe if someone who's had a second child, they'll say, oh, it was so much easier. But it's usually fraught with complications, stressful. But I actually wrote a glowing article about this company in Forbes because 
they we had issues but they fixed them the manager came over shook our hand thank you for your feedback i remember that when we were leaving and that meant so much to to me even though it was a complete disaster i wrote this beautiful article about them because i just appreciated the effort so much the willingness to care yeah they were like really interested in your feedback he gave you his email i remember Mm -hmm. all that sort of stuff yeah he didn't even know who i was yeah he didn't know i had a forbes column that was going to end up being in it Uh, So I wanted to shift gears a little bit. I know you also spend a lot of time looking at the future of customer experience. That's actually what your book's all about. So where is all of this going? What does the future of customer experience actually look like? So my book focuses on actually the next five years, not super into the future because when I was talking with my publisher, he really felt like businesses still need content today. And I agree because most businesses are not even achieving the table stakes of customer experience, the basics. But when we look 20 years into the future, I look at a report from Lippincott, which is a research company in New York. They have six trends that they believe will ultimately transform society and consumer behavior. And they pitch this idea of imagine a world where you don't even remember how to drive, but you drive all the time. And you never go to the doctor, but you see the doctor every week. And you're always online, but you never technically log on. And you're always shopping, but you're never in line. So these are just a few tastes of some of the uh, predictions they have about the year 2039. And I suppose all of this is going to be powered and fueled by technology largely. Yeah, so technology is really set to change consumer behavior. Like today, many of our experiences have a lot of stops and starts. And even just the way we perceive ourselves in our lives, like we have one job. But in the future, we'll probably have many, many jobs. And technology will flow in the background moving around us rather than all of the effort that we make. Like even in our house, Jacob, we have a lot of technology, but it requires a lot of uh, muscle. Like I'm, I'm a little obsessed with technology. We have a lot of smart devices. We have, I don't want to say uh, its name because it will turn on in the background, but it controls our lights, our locks, cameras. So we got all sorts of fun things floating around in here. Yeah, but it's all disjointed. It's different systems, different efforts. Like our uh, alarm is through an app. The lights are through the voice activated assistant. Um, Who will remain nameless. Right. So it's still it's still pretty disjointed, all the systems. They don't work together around us. We have to power everything manually. And most people don't even have this in their house. Like We're an anomaly. Even what we have, though, from an IoT perspective, is extremely basic. Like fans, lights, locking the door, etc. We have one fan, and even that one fan was like a nightmare to find one fan. <laughs> <laughs> we went through like three different fans just to find one that could be uh, quote-unquote smart. Yeah, and we totally overpaid for it. Yeah. Overpaid it. <laughs> all right, let's not tell everybody my obsession with technology and that I'm overpaying for everything because I'm going to get pitches to buy all sorts of weird things. Um, okay, so your book is focused, I guess, five years, which is, well, and my book is 10 years, and I think you have sort of the same rationale that it's far enough where it might be, where it'll be different, but also not too far where it's not practical and, and useful. Because 20 years, I mean, it's like... Yeah, no one really knows. Yeah, nobody knows what's going to happen in 20 years. But my audience is, when I tell them in my speech, last, the other week, somebody in the audience tweeted me. They said that it was a dystopian view, that they were freaked out by my dystopian. But I'm not afraid of technology because my platform is that customers are stressed out. Life is stressful. Jacob and I have a daughter, you know, we're really busy we're willing to give over data and trust companies that are going to make our lives easier and better. But that is the key. So many companies today make customers' lives harder to make their businesses flow more easily or or be more profitable. The company that makes it harder on themselves and makes it easier on the customer will win. Like Apple, Steve Jobs has a quote about, I don't remember the, the actual quote, but it's so hard to make something simple to use or easy to understand. Even like Jacob and I, our jobs, we take complex concepts and we boil them down into extremely, like even oversimplified ideas that are digestible for people. And that's, that's our job. Um, So if you are able to take complex concepts or 
Um, even bring experiences that are often only for a select few and bring them to the masses. Like these are the experiences that, that people crave. Do you have a favorite customer experience story? I have one recently, actually. We just I just ordered something on Wayfair. Okay, just all the ladies in the audience, do your husbands ever ask you a question and then just answer it themselves? <laughs> are hey. you mansplaining? No, no, no I'm, <laughs> I'm giving, I'm, I'm going to ask you first, but I just remembered I had a good one as well um, from, from Wayfair. And and because I rarely talk about the customer experience side of things, so when I have a good customer experience, I'm like, okay, okay, well, how do you tell the Wayfair show. story? So I, I ordered this uh, this table on Wayfair, this wooden table, and it came and it was slightly damaged. And you basically have this opportunity: you go online, you put that the product is damaged. You don't have to call anybody, you don't have to talk to anybody, and they you just re- request a replacement, and they just say keep the old one, or we're going to send you the new one. Literally takes 20 seconds. They don't ask you to justify or explain or go through this whole process, probably because they understand that doing so, it's just cheaper and more time efficient just to send them a replacement product. Yeah, I remember a story about... It was easy. I don't remember which retailer it was, um, and I'll, I'll put it in the show notes, but it was a retailer that someone had bought like the wrong coat or the wrong size and it might even been a coat for their dog and this retailer said coat okay coat for the dog yeah they said give it to somebody it was either dog or a child someone vulnerable i remember (laughs) and they said just give it to somebody who needs a coat and that was like years ago and no one was really like amazon wasn't doing this but it's just so generous it just yeah it makes the customer's life easier it's good for karma do you have a favorite story or example yeah, actually, I do. Or, or it's bad old. one. Good or bad one. Yeah, it's kind of old. When I was a teenager, we had two dogs. One of them was totally nuts. Like, she was a Dalmatian. Someone probably saw that movie 101 Dalmatians and got a Dalmatian for their kid and then realized the Dalmatian was completely nuts and gave her to the shelter. My mom adopted her. Her name was Dottie. And she ended up, I had these prom shoes that, you know, when you're a teenager, you don't have a lot of stuff. You don't have a lot of money. So if you get something nice, it's a really big deal. And I remember these shoes. They were so beautiful. They were leather and platform and had chunky heels. And they were just absolutely to die for it at 16 years old. Well, Dottie thought so too, my Dalmatian. And she thought they looked like a delicious snack. And so she ate them. So my mom and I are horrified, and they were expensive too. We were frustrated. We drove to Nordstrom at Cerrito Small, all of you in the OC who know where that is. And we showed her the shoes, the the um, saleswoman, because we wanted to get the exact same pair, exact same size. And she actually took them back and just let me return them for a completely new pair of shoes. And this was <clears throat> 20 years ago when... This whole idea of being service oriented, it wasn't sexy. It wasn't cool. Nobody had a customer experience column on Forbes. Like no one, (laughs) it was just the Nordstrom, I mean, Nordstrom way. They've always had this in their DNA and their blood. Um, And they're kind of struggling now as they awkwardly go through a digital transformation. But it's always been in their DNA and culture to just do the right thing and invest in their relationships and treat customers well. And so I'll never forget... Yeah, and have empathy. So I'll never forget the the chewed up pair of shoes that Nordstrom took back as a return. Very cool. I like that story. Simple and practical. And uh, so we, I guess th- from 20 years ago, we can see different uh, examples between something like a Wayfair from today or an Amazon from today versus Nordstrom from 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. So it's not always about technology. Sometimes it's about the human component as well. Yeah, just being like a nice person. Most businesses are not nice people. Yeah, I agree. So that's a big lesson. Don't forget to be human when you are interacting with your customers, but also with your employees. Your book talks about these 10 guiding principles, and we probably won't get into each, into all 10 of them in detail, but maybe we could just go through what these 10 are, and you can give a sentence or two about each one. Do you remember all 10? Mm-hmm. You do? Of course. Yeah, I've been doing these wow, that's interviews impressive. and speeches, Jacob. Have that's crazy faith. that you remember. I'm going to test you. <laughs> I have your book open right here. Do you um, want me to do it in the three buckets, which is easier for people to understand? The three buckets, the topics? Um, It's up to you. You can either do the, the 10 principles. Maybe just do the 10 principles because yeah. they're specific and people yeah. would relate to them. Okay. And just a sentence about each they one. They might be out of order because I've remembered them in three buckets now for my speech. <laughs> That's but, fine. I can read them here. here the no, 10. no, I have most of them. 
Um, the first is the first are easy. This is my trip to Amazon because actually what I, I originally was going to write a book about technology because I thought technology is everything. Spotify, Netflix, Amazon, Apple, like look at all these technology companies. These are the experiences we want. But then I went up to Amazon and I didn't find my secret sauce and I thought, oh my God, it's mindset. That's what these companies can't get. So the first chapter is on what is a customer experience mindset? And it's just an attitude. It's that jumping out of bed in the morning, excited to serve someone else. The second piece is culture. So what does it mean to have a customer centric culture? And there I talk about employee experience and the links between the two disciplines. The third chapter is on leadership development because what I found is that companies make this huge mistake, which is hiring a chief customer officer and saying, okay, done, nailed customer experience. But it's ridiculous to think one person can change your company or even one CEO who's set to turn around the company. No, it's not going to happen. It's hiring leaders and managers and then developing them into being employee and customer centric. That is really the missing link. And then we get into the the technology chapters, which are, you know, I've helped to shape this category of customer experience. And I've written a lot about customer experience technology, which is a whole category now that's worth billions and billions of dollars. And there you'll find information about cognitive computing technologies and AI and robotic process automation. You know, in, the, in these chapters, you do get a little technical and specific, but I couldn't write this book without providing that um, because I felt that readers deserved it. And then we talk about digital transformation. I know I'm mixing my chapters up, but you're not no, paying it. But digital transformation is also actually a big one. Um, a lot of people I know listening to this are interested in digital transformation as well. Yeah, 85% of executives believe they have two years or less to make significant inroads in digital transformation before being left behind to competitors. And that's from IDC. So clearly, like, and, and every time I go to give a speech, I ask the audience, like, how many of you are doing digital transformation? How many are done? And how many are doing nothing? What, what is that, by the way? How would you explain digital transformation to somebody? Solving traditional problems with technology. That's pretty simple. But clearly it's a strategy. It's not just that. I think it means something different for every company. But without fail, when I ask my audiences, how many of you are doing nothing? Like a third of the room has told me they're doing nothing. And so it's really a shame because if we want to provide better employee experiences and customer experiences, we have to start thinking about long-term technology investments. Totally agree. Um, okay, go on to the next... And so we also in the book talk at length about analytics, about this new area of forward looking analytics, because now with machine learning and AI, you know, in the past, we'd look at what happened in back of us and say, well, here's what happened and here's how that can inform the future. But now we can use machine learning and AI to predict what could happen in the future. And that has huge implications for not just marketing, but so many areas of our business. Um, I also talk about customer, fo I'm totally mixing up my chapters. Sorry, honey, but you're my husband. So you'll just, they don't need to I go need. in order. <laughs> we also talk about marketing. There's a great quote from Ann Hanley that what would your marketing look like if your customers signed your paycheck? And I think that's how marketers need to think today. So in the book, we look at some of the biggest trends, not just with customer focused marketing, but media consumption habits of young people, of how young people want companies that have an environmental soul that care about the political and environmental decisions they're making because the Edelman Trust Barometer actually, I'm rambling a little bit, but the Edelman Trust Barometer actually shows that employees are now looking to their employers to take a social and political stance. They, the trust in the government is at an all time low. So what does that mean for how you talk to your employees? What does that mean for your customer marketing? And so now it's like nothing you do is in a vacuum. Everything you do is public. This new level of transparency has huge implications for how you communicate, how you make decisions. And, you know, marketing, it's some of these chapters, there, there is a little bit of everything. So it's hard to kind of boil it down to one area. But the theme throughout the book is just this customer focus. So no matter if it's, I'm talking about a technology strategy 
or an analytics strategy or personalization, which I get into later. It's all singularly focused on customer experience. What is it that you think, and those those were all the 10 principles. And ethics, we forgot designing oh, a code of ethics privacy. and data privacy. Do you wanna talk about that one really quick? Well, my, my identity was stolen. Oh yeah. <laughs> and I used to think I that the that world story. was like a fair and balanced place until that happened. And I, I realized- remember, I remember the website and I was like, hey, I, I didn't know you were in the, the cryptocurrency game. Right, it was a Bitcoin website. And that was when I had this epiphany that, wow, it really is the wild, wild west of the internet still. Because we found this website, they put me up there as an employee with my real name, pretty, took a lot of a gall for them. They put up a Facebook page with my Instagram photos and like fake- Wait, they created a fake Facebook page? Yeah, fake quotes about me, oh like, like showing me living my best life as an employee of this company. Wow. And I sent a message to them on chat and they like laughed at me, ha ha, like there's nothing you can do. And they were right. And for months there was nothing I could do until Jacob's little brother, who's actually pretty smart, said, hey Blake, you know, I looked them up. They're host providers in California. I think they were in uh, England or, or India, but the host was in California. And so that was how I got it taken down. But it took months and people were contacting me. Hey Blake, I got scammed by this company. Like, looks like you work there. It was just so upsetting. And it was a reminder that it's a very it's a very vulnerable position to be in as a customer when your data is stolen. With AI, machine learning, you know, everything is moving very quickly. Most of us are signing terms and conditions without ever reading them. Most of us are extremely uncomfortable with our data being auto-collected, which it is. So as a company, how are we being thoughtful about protecting the customer, even from their own naivety? I love that story. Um, about how your data was so and I remember <laughs> when you were talking to the guy in chat support and he was basically like you know haha see what you can do there's nothing you can do you're going to be fine yeah or we're going to be fine um, so it, it really kind of the gall of some people that I mean they know what they're doing and they're doing it anyway so but thankfully we were able to get it taken care of well we have a couple of minutes left and before I get into some rapid fire questions for you maybe you can share what is it that the employee experience side can learn from customer experience and even vice versa what, what can these two different functions learn from each other because they represent different areas of the company one is the internal one is the external but at the same time one can't exist without the other they're sort of like the yin and yang so what what can we learn from each other in this space we're all curators designing experiences for other people and so the way to be a good experience designer is to really know who you are designing an experience for and what that individual wants. And it requires extra effort. And all of us are in relationships in our own lives. We know what it means to give and nurture a relationship or when we're being sloppy. And if we want to attract people to us, whether they are employees or customers, today requires being extremely thoughtful, not leaving it up to chance. And we have all of these amazing tools that help us in that pursuit of, des of designing delicious experiences for other people that they actually want and that make them want to be around us. And so it's really this theme of earning your keep every single day, not taking it for granted. Um, and that's really how as an employer or as a business trying to make money, you're not ever gonna make money or attract really smart employees by accident they're not, I mean, people are very selfish and they have choice. And so whenever you have choice, like you have to be better, you have to give more, you have to be smarter and be more thoughtful about how you create an experience for someone else. And that experience is a competitive advantage because no matter if it's at work or as a customer, today people value experiences over things, access over ownership, and that has huge implications um, for our businesses, because when you have all these people who have the luxury of choice, then you better be good or else you're not going to attract anybody. So if you're working in the employee experience space, what is maybe one or two things that we can learn from those who work in the customer experience space? I like to talk about Capital One. They're really a company I write about in my book that understand the value of this culture of kindness. And they actually treat their call center agents with respect, like the Ritz Carlton, they give employees money to be able to actually do things for customers when 
customers are going through hard times. And so you're getting these stories out of Capital One that are like unbelievable, like a call center agent who recognizes a customer is having a really bad day and sends her on a tropical vacation. And then the, the agent and the customer end up on the Ellen show and millions of people see this story all over the world. That is not an accident. It's an operationalized culture of kindness that comes out of this young bank, Capital One, that's only like 30 something years old. And so the point is, these things are not accidents. Being a successful business today takes hard work, but if you're just the one who has common sense, if you have integrity, if you are if you have fair business practices, I believe that you can make it based on these old principles of integrity, of a commitment to being better. Like Jeff Bezos recently said, I believe that one day Amazon will fail. Amazon will go bankrupt. And that's this humility, this awareness of it, his company's own mortality. Like even Amazon could disappear overnight. That keeps us humble, keeps him humble. And earning our keep every single day, no matter if it's our in our relationships with our family, with our employees, with our customers, it's that humility, like all of this could just go away. So every single day we need to try our best and commit to, the, to what we orig- commit to our originally established on vision and not let it lose its luster over time. So are you saying that customer experience people have more humility and vulnerability than employee experience people? No. <laughs> so from all of that, what, how would you boil that down into what, can the employee experience people learn from customer experience people? I think you are in service to your people. You work, your employees are your customers. You work in customer service every day. Um, Often people joke that HR, like they're really just your lawyers who protect you from being sued. Don't be the company that is notorious for having an HR that just protects the company. You really need to make sure that you have human resources for the humans that work for you. And so don't forget that you are also in the business of serving customers, but those customers work inside the walls of your company. I think that's a good point. And you heard it, Blake is not saying that customer experience people are more... No, I'm not. (laughs) (laughs) We all have humility and vulnerability in the experience space. Well, to wrap up, I have a couple uh, rapid fire questions for you. So what has been your greatest failure? (laughs) My greatest failure. You had to know these were coming. I know you've listened to an episode of my podcast before. So what's your greatest failure? You know, I I hate to say this, but I think my greatest failure was spending so much of my my youth um, not liking myself and being really hard on myself and trying to impress other people. I wish I would have just um, spent less time beating myself up and embracing how quirky and sensitive I was and not ever trying to grow up fast. Um, I I wish as a young woman, I I would have liked myself more as I do now that I'm 35. (laughs) What's your most embarrassing moment? I don't want to draw into the like childhood. Like I might. No, not childhood. I mean like uh, a grown, like maybe a work memory. Most embarrassing thing that happened to you at work. If you have one. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I used to be extremely insecure and uncomfortable in small groups. So I think I've, probably exposed how introverted I am by looking like I've wanted to cry when people have called on me in meetings, um, you know, many years ago, um, that, that, that's it. Those are painful memories. I wish I could like erase from my brain. What are you most proud of? I'm proud work-wise. I am so proud. I'm actually so proud to be a speaker because every single time I get on the stage, I face my fear of, speaking in front of people and I have faked it so for so long but now I actually like even I walked off a stage last week and I people said oh my god I loved your stories and I I really the clients were happy and I just felt like you know I I got a speaking coach I've worked really hard on on this and I'm really proud of how much I faced my fear it has not been easy as you know Oh, I know. I mean, most people say that they would uh, rather face death than speaking on stage. So it's definitely definitely something that requires a lot of work. And yes, you've been working on it quite a bit. Uh, what's been the hardest business decision you've ever had to make? The hardest business decision I've ever had to make 
was quitting, a, I think probably quitting jobs, um, quitting a nonprofit where I felt like I was being bullied by the, the boss and uh, not having anything else to look toward and being on unemployment, having to go on unemployment multiple times. Like there were a few years there where I just, I didn't know what I was going to do. It was a complete leap of faith. I remember. And even coming to New York was a little, or coming to San Francisco from New York was a little bit of a leap of faith as well. Uh, last two questions for you. Who's the best mentor you've ever had? Best mentor, probably you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you've taught me so much about, about this being a bit, you know, having this business. But I'm not easy. I'm pretty hard. <laughs> mm. I don't think either of us are easy. You, pro you probably so have So it kind of works. Okay. Yeah. I'll, hey, I'll take it. I'll take any praise I can get. Well, thank you for that. And maybe last question for you. If you were doing a different career, what do you think you would have ended up doing and why? I love to bake and cook. I think it would have been fun. You always say, oh, let's open a bakery. Um, I also love, I well, mean, there's so many things. I want I you to open the bakery. Mm, I just want to eat there. I love dog. I love working with dogs. Um, I think I would have been a great, like, dog lady i don't even know how that would translate dog is our two dogs are like passed out next to us yeah. two yorkie rescues <laughs> one is sprawled on the couch and the other one's curled <laughs> up in a little ball mm. uh, all right so dog lady whatever that is it seems like it has a lot of income potential which would have been very good <laughs> for us with a family uh, or a a baker well blake where can people go to learn more about you your book, where can they buy this magnificent book that literally just came out? It's brand new. Anything that you want to mention, please feel free to do so. Yeah, I would love for your listeners to find me at blakemichellemorgan.com or look up my book on Amazon, The Customer of the Future, and would really love to hear from any of you. My email, you can send me an email, blake at blakemichellemorgan.com. Well, thank you for being a wonderful guest. And... I love you very much. Aw, thanks, honey. Thanks for this promotion opportunity. <laughs> I love you too. There we go. Well, thanks everyone for tuning in. This has been another episode of the Future of Work podcast. My guest, again, has been my wife, Blake Morgan. Make sure to check out her book. It's called The Customer of the Future, available wherever books are sold. And you can also just Google her or go to her website, blakemichellemorgan at gmail.com. I'll see all of you next week. Thanks for tuning in to the Future of Work podcast. I hope you enjoyed the show. Please do me a favor and rate and review the show on iTunes or whatever your preferred podcast platform is. And remember, if you want to take your education even further by getting access to courses based on some of the themes that I explore in this show, then check out futureofworkuniversity.com. If you're interested in being added to my newsletter, you can do that by visiting thefutureorganization.com forward slash newsletter. And you can also get in touch with me directly if you have any inquiries for podcast sponsorships, working with me, or having me keynote your next event. My email is jacob at thefutureorganization.com. I will see you next week.